Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us on today's webinar, How to Become a Certified Ethical Hacker. My name is Camille Dupuy, and I will be moderating today's webinar. We'll go ahead and introduce Keytron in just a few moments, um, but first I'd like to go through a few tips to make the webinar a little bit more engaging and uh, interactive for our attendees today. So as listeners, you are on listen-only mode. Um, so this means you're muted, but you're more than welcome to ask questions at any time by typing them in the control panel um, in the question feature. And we'll save some time at the end to go through those with Keytron. If we don't get to all of the questions today, um, we'll make sure to follow up with you. So with that, we'll talk about um, CPEs real quick. So if you are looking for CPEs, you may qualify by watching this webinar. After the presentation is over, we will send a follow-up email that has a link to a form to fill out to request a completion certification. And, and what you'll do with that is send it to your own certifying body. Um, on the screen there, you see a few links to check to see if this is eligible per your certifying body. The requirements are a little bit different for each, so make sure you go ahead and uh, take a peek there to see if you will be eligible. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and move on to meet Keytron. Uh, very excited to have you back with us. We've done a few webinars together and excited to talk about uh, ethical hacking today. So excited to have your valuable um, contemporary insight into the world of cybersecurity, Keytron. Um, so a little bit about Keytron. He is regularly engaged in training, consulting, penetration testing, and incident response for government, Fortune 50, and small businesses. Um, in addition to being the lead author of the best-selling book, Chained Exploits, Advanced Hacking Attacks from Start to Finish, uh, you'll see him on major news outlets such as CNN, Fox News, and others on a regular basis as a featured analyst concerning cybersecurity events and issues. Uh, for years, Keytron has worked regularly as both an employee and a consultant for several intelligence community organizations on breaches and offensive cybersecurity attack development. Keytron also provides world-class training for the top training organizations in the industry. Uh, today, Keytron will be diving into ethical hacking and how it relates to careers, education, and training in cybersecurity. Um, so with that, Keytron, you want to tell us a little bit about how you got started in ethical hacking and, and kind of what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you uh, so much, Camille. So for me, it started as a um, just kind of a curiosity thing. And it, it wasn't, I, I didn't have, I guess, a planned trajectory to ever be doing security. You know, it's literally, I was in a, a class in high school called Diversified Technology uh, in in Akron, Mississippi, Mississippi. So shout outs to Mississippi there. Um, and it was a class, there was one computer, you know, and out of us, I think 15 or so students that were in that class, everybody else wanted to do like robotics and, and all these other things. And I was the only one that really, or, well, me and uh, a partner uh, that I partnered with was the only two people that showed any real interest in the computer technology. And, and at that point it was just DOS, like that's all there was. There was no, Nothing, no windows or nothing like that. So um, that was kind of my start into it. And after that, I got into, you know, once I got into college, I was uh, interested in this thing that was starting called the internet or the web, uh, as we used to call it back then. I got connected to some bulletin boards, started asking questions uh, about, you know, how to navigate systems, got into some systems I wasn't supposed to be into accidentally. And that amazed me, you know, once I saw the, the network that I had stumbled into, it amazed me that I was able to get there. So, of course, as a kid, you know, the natural curiosity was, well, hmm, I wonder how many other places uh, I could get to. And that's kind of how that was what started my trajectory. Now, it wasn't until well after college. I actually, um, in 2000, 2000 or 2001, the founder of InfoSec and I met up and became friends and we started working on some stuff together. And that's really when I realized this could actually be a career, you know, something I've done as a hobby for years. Uh, I just actually switched gears right then and turned it into a career and just started to be a little more focused with it. And my background was mostly networking. Like I built, you know, uh, small networks, big networks, routing, switching, uh, you know, learned about Microsoft, got my MCSE, 
learned about active directory and all that stuff. So just a traditional uh, IT arc, but I turned it into security really early. Sure. Very cool. So definitely, you know, a great person to have with us joining today and, you know, kind of an expert in the field, really. So uh, you actually teach certified ethical hacking, um, you know, as a course. You want to tell us a little bit um, about why someone else could, could earn this and, you know, kind of what they could do with a certified ethical hacking certification? Yeah, sure. So one thing that I've always found to be um, really interesting, you know, I took my first uh ethical hacking course from Jack actually. And one of the things that, that I took away from that is at the time there was really not many people doing anything related to ethical hacking. So the people that were in that class were real heavy hitters. You know, they were like really, really deeply involved in it. And I learned so much from just the people that were in the class, you know, because we'd hang around after class and uh, people would show different hacks and attach that they were working on. Um, and just the networking, you know, I got involved in being an expert witness from that class. Like I'd never even heard of that. Like I didn't know what that was. You know, um, I got involved in that because there was one guy that was an expert witness on, um, you know, child exploitation and stuff. So he pl pulled me into that. So just from that one interaction, that one class, it literally had so much to do with how my career shaped from that point on, because for one, I got a taste of other things that weren't ethical hacking, but were direct spinoffs of ethical hacking, or at least that knowledge base. So I think it's a great place to, um, to start your career in cybersecurity because of the fact that it touches on so many different things that are related to so many different job roles. Sure. And now, Keetron, could you tell us a little bit about, um, if someone did take this course, you know, what would they, they kind of learn in it? So they would learn basic things about, um, you know, how systems are discovered, right? Because that's a big part of it. You know, you can have a system that's connected to the internet, but if it's, and it's not secure, but, you know, as an attacker, you still have to find that system. So if I'm looking for Camille's web server, how do I find that web server amongst the billions and billions of other web servers that are out there on the internet? So one thing you'll learn, and one of the first things you'll learn is how to do reconnaissance. You know, how do we find a target stuff that's out there? Even when they do things to mask it and hide it, we spend about a day, you know, just learning how to discover and find targets, devices out there on the internet. Um, and that would be like a kind of a first day type thing. Um, you'll also learn how to, once you find those devices, how do we enumerate them? In other words, how do we scan them in a way and find an information and find vulnerabilities without the victim knowing that we're scanning them? In other words, we learn reconnaissance, but then we also learn stealthy reconnaissance so that we can do it in a way that it's not going to trigger alarms, not going to set off IDSs. Uh, we get into all kinds of evasion stuff and things like that. And then we finally get to eventually, now that we've found out what this device is, let's say Camille's running a uh, Microsoft IIS web server version 8.5, we then go and research and find vulnerabilities specifically related to that web server. And then we try to exploit it uh, with known exploits out there, or in some cases we'll, you know, craft an author exploits if there's budget in the engagement for that. So after we've learned how to exploit systems, we spend a considerable amount of time learning how to give yourself what we call persistent access, which is a big thing for APTs. They want persistent access. They want to be in, but they want to stay in. Uh, if you look at all of the threat hunting documentation out there, I mean, you got average dwell times of 18 months to two years of how long the, the threat actors just hang around inside the environment before they're discovered. So we get into some techniques for that, you know, to where it's nearly impossible for them to get you all the way out. And then we end it kind of with uh, getting into web application stuff and track covering. You know, how do you cover up the evidence that you were ever there in the first place? Sure. And that always surprises me just to just to kind of hear that statistic on just how long sometimes these people, you know, lurk in these systems waiting to to make that attack. So that's always uh, always scary and uh, interesting. Um, moving on, if if you think about this in the career point of view, um, what can you do with it and, and kind of what is talk about the career path a little bit about, you know, where you start out and where the ultimate goal is for a lot of, a lot of individuals with this certification. 
Yeah, so basically, um, you know, it's, I've done so many of these charts, you know, where I've written articles and published things on uh, career trajectories, how to get from this point to that point. But to be honest with you, if you look at the, the screen that we have up now, uh, Certified Ethical Hacker is a good place to start for any of these roles. Um, going all the way across from the entry level at the top there, if you look at cybersecurity technician, I mean, there, that could mean a lot of different things, but definitely having CEH or ethical hacker level knowledge will enhance, you know, your ability there and what you're actually doing there. Um, from a pen tester standpoint, this is kind of like the entry level into pen testing. Um, you know, if you were to be hired as a senior pen tester, an organization would expect you to know how to do all the CEH, you know, themed objectives, right? Like all the stuff that I just named, reconnaissance, vulnerability identification, exploitation, track covering, you would be expected to be able to perform those things as an entry level uh, or as a senior level pen tester. So entry level would be learning how to do those things. And that's where CEH kind of sits in the middle and sets you up perfectly for that. But even the advanced things, you know, our classes are pretty dynamic in that we can shape them around the groups that we have. Like, for example, if I'm teaching an ethical hacker class and everyone in the class has 10 years experience pen testing, that's going to be delivered very differently than if it's a class of, right. you know, 10 people that have never heard of pen testing before they got there that week. So we're very flexible and dynamic in how we deliver it. And we do get into exploit writing and stuff like that. I've done that in the, just the CEH class because uh, the audience demanded it. Like they were at a level that they could, could get that. So we were able to shift gears and give them more advanced things to do. But that leads you to the, the more advanced uh, types of roles there. And even for people like CISOs, uh, you know, security managers, we encourage them to jump into this class as well because Again, you're more of a you're a more effective manager of security people, specifically technical security people, if you have some understanding of what it is they're doing. And I think that's one of the challenges for a lot of CISOs is they just kind of push have to push stuff downstream and assume that the people that they have in those positions know, you know, what the heck is going on. And I think it's a great idea every once in a while. Uh, for the CISOs to just step back, jump into a class like this. CH is kind of a good view of the technical and the policy stuff because we touch on some of that as well and just sit in there for five days suck up what you can so that you have an idea of what your technical people are doing perfect um well as we move on here i know everyone's excited to to see uh Keytron's hack demo and we'll get to that in in just a moment and wanted to remind everyone that we will be saving some time for questions so feel free to start submitting those and and we'll be um reviewing those um but you know if if you were going to do certified ethical hacker as a boot camp um real quick just kind of Keytron, could you run through a typical day of of what you'd be doing yeah, so generally uh, what we do is we would, we, you know, we start each day off with kind of a recap of the previous day. So let's just say it's Tuesday. We'll kind of do a quick recap of all the things that we covered on Monday. I will also do a walkthrough of Monday's CTF, you know, the evening or the afternoon capture the flag exercise. I don't give the answers that night. What I do is I give them the night to think about it, try to figure it out on your own. And then the very next morning, one of the first things I do is I say, all right, here's my solution. And I walk through how I would solve that CTF. Uh, so that's usually how the day start. Start off on kind of a, a high point of uh, doing some demonstrations and stuff like that. And then we get into, um, you know, whatever the topic happens to be for that part of the morning. And generally my schedule is I'll lecture for about 45 minutes, sometimes an hour on a topic. Um, follow that with a little bit of demonstration, you know, to kind of drive home what we just discussed. And then I'll turn around and, and hand it to the students and say, all right, now take a look at lab six. Okay, lab six is basically what I just demonstrated. So now I'm going to give you an hour, 45 minutes or however long we assign for that lab to see if you can reproduce what I just showed you. Um, and that, that's pretty much the best learning method for content like this. You know, watching me do it is great. But if you can't sit down to the keyboard and do it yourselves, you didn't really learn it. And we kind of drive that point home with this class specifically. 
Perfect. So speaking of the the kind of the hands-on work, um, you have offered to to show us something from the realm of ethical hacking. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to launch a poll now so the audience can vote on what they'd like to see uh, you perform in today's presentation. Um, so as I open this poll, Keytron, do you wanna just real briefly touch on what each of these, um, what each of these options would be showing today? Um, sure, so the identifying targets via DNS would just be me uh, going out to the internet um, using DNS recon and some other stuff to find targets based on us picking a specific uh, organization or whatever the case may be. So it would just kind of show how we would find the targets out there on the internet. Um, two is basically where I do a walkthrough scenario of why you should never use public Wi-Fi. Uh, I show how using a very slick man in a middle attack, you can be compromised just by going to Starbucks or going to um, you know, a hotel Wi-Fi or any Wi-Fi that you don't control completely. You could very easily get compromised. And a lot of executives actually get compromised uh, that way. So that one's a little more involved, but, I, but that's what I demonstrate in that particular attack. And then uh, the vulnerability identification exploitation, we scan a box find vulnerabilities in it, and then we exploit those vulnerabilities based on uh, what we find in the scan uh, to take control of that machine. So that's pretty much what they break down to. Sounds good. All right, so we'll give everyone just a few more seconds to, uh, to vote here. Looks like we have um, people interested in each topic, um, but we'll give it just a moment here to see, um, to see what you're going to be showing us today. Yeah, absolutely. As I start the appropriate VMs here based on the, <laughs> the statistics I'm seeing come in there. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. I'm going to go ahead and, and end the polling now. Um, it looks like, oops, we got a couple more as I'm about to click it. Um, we are at, by just about a vote, um, it looks like man in the middle attack um, is what what uh, you're going to be showing us today. So kind of taking a look at that uh, public Wi-Fi usage. So oh, with that. That, that one by one vote, that's pretty, uh, pretty tight race there. Yeah, there's some, some interest in, in quite a few things there. So um, yeah. that'll be interesting. Maybe we can do, um, you know, look at that another time. So the vulnerability identification to exploitation. Um, but with that, Keytron, I'll let you go ahead and, and take over the screen and, and uh, show us how it's done. All right, absolutely. So let me uh, go ahead and share. All right, just wanna make sure you guys can see my... Uh, my Linux screen here. I typed the word hello in it. Yes, we can see that. Looks good. Awesome. All right, so the scenario here is, uh, you know, this victim, let's go ahead and get these kind of beside each other. The scenario is this victim here is actually just, you know, walked into Starbucks and gotten on the Starbucks Wi-Fi. And there's also an attacker who's this person that's uh, on the same Wi-Fi in Starbucks, okay? so. As you can see, this victim's IP is 188. Now, keep in mind, as the attacker, you wouldn't have to know this because what I would do, I'm going to do an art poisoning attack. And in real life, what I might do is just art poison everyone on the Starbucks Wi-Fi to ensure that I get the right person. But in this case, to, to speed it up, I'm going to go ahead and just attack this particular IP address. But the way it would work is I would simply first, you know, via art and we, in the class, we actually go into explanations of how ARP work, uh, how the protocol works and those types of things so that you understand what the, you know, what we're actually exploiting. But here, I'm just gonna demonstrate it. So first thing is I need to set up ARP spoof because I need to tell the victim, which is, uh, I believe it's 188, that I'm the gateway, which is dot two. 
new keyboard here. And then simultaneously, I will need to tell the gateway that I'm the victim. So I, I'll need to have both these running at the same time. All right, so, you know, telling one lie in one direction, telling it in the opposite direction. <clears throat> in order for this to work, I will also need to turn on something called IP forwarding, which basically makes my man in the middle machine here act like a router. Now to show you this work, we're gonna just ping the gateway from here. And ping is just a way to reach out and touch it. And we're gonna do that continuously, all right? And while that's going on, I want to also show you that in this machine's art cache, because I want you to actually see the poison happen, we can see that dot two is at this MAC address. And that's gonna be part of the poison. We're gonna you know, actually uh, write over that with some bogus information. So the first thing you'll see happen is as I start the poison, uh, let me make sure my forwarding is not on yet. All right, so it's not on. I'm purposely not going to turn it on until after. So I'll start the poison. And what you're going to see is the pings will cease to be successful, right? You see the pings are timing out now. That's because I poisoned this machine, and it thinks that dot two is at my MAC address on my machine and not the actual gateway router, which would be like the Starbucks router. So if we look at the art cache now as compared to what it was before, we can clearly see that the MAC address associated with the gateway, which is dot two, has changed now. And another telltale sign is the fact that it's a duplicate entry. You can see that it shows two same MAC addresses with two different IPs. All right, that's the evidence of the poison happening. So now this machine literally thinks I'm the gateway, which means anytime you tries to go out to the internet, it comes to my interface first, and then it's my job as a man in the middle to forward that on. Again, we're still on Starbucks Wi-Fi here. So I'm gonna turn on IP forwarding just by making this file, which has a value of zero, make it a one. Usually in class, what I do is I'll quiz the students and say, okay, if zero is, is what's making it not forward, what do you think I need to change it to to make it forward? And you know, I give them a chance to answer that. But by writing a one into that file, now you can see it's got a one value. It turned on forwarding and now you can see the pings are back successful. So now at that point, we've actually completed the in the middle part of the attack, which means now all this victim's traffic to and from the internet at Starbucks is coming through my interface so I can see all their traffic. And here's where it gets interesting. Now that I've got the man in the middle going, that means I'm gonna see any DNS query. You know, when you type, for example, uh, infosecinstitute.com in your web browser, what happens is your computer sends a query to whatever your DNS server is and says, where is InfoSec Institute? And your DNS server will respond and say, InfoSec Institute is at this IP address. All right, and we break down DNS and go into it to show you how that works. But what I'm gonna do now is call DNS poisoning on top of the art poisoning. So I'm going to look for any queries for Facebook, and then I'm gonna respond on behalf of the real DNS server out there, because remember, I'm in the middle and lie to the victim and tell it Facebook is at this IP address, which is uh, 141, which is mine. And to do that, it's pretty simple. I'm just gonna create a, a host file here named Camille. I'm gonna say that Facebook, because we're framing you for all the hacks today, Camille, so you, you're gonna- Oh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so we're gonna say that Facebook is at 141. And in case they're smart enough to do a reverse lookup, we're gonna say that 141 is also Facebook. Now this is, again, on the local Wi-Fi. So while I'm setting this up, you know, the, one of the first questions I usually get is what about VPNs? 
Well, actually, I want you to connect to VPN because remember, before you connect the VPN, you know, you generally have to still connect to the Wi-Fi and get that little proxy page. So in reality here, I would probably be uh, men in the middle and pretending to be that little Google Starbucks or whatever it is you click on to accept uh, Starbucks as Wi-Fi. And that is when I would have you. Now, in this particular instance, I'm going to run the DNS spoof tool and point it at my Camille file, okay? My MacBook is sensitive, or my uh, iMac is sensitive about sniffing, so I have to get permission to do it. So now that we've got this set up, what, watch what happens when the victim tries to ping Facebook. Look at where it thinks Facebook is. So now again, we're still on Starbucks, and at this point, this person, if they were to try to go to Facebook, they'd end up at my version of it. Or, or end up at my machine. Now, currently, I don't have a web server set up that's got a fake copy of Facebook. So let me show you how in like 30 seconds we can set that up. Fortunately, there's a tool written by uh, Dave Kennedy, who uh, founded uh, this company called Binary Defense, I believe it is. Sorry, Dave. Just Dave Kennedy is the guy. Um, social engineers toolkit all right and what it does is it automates the process of setting this up setting up the fake website okay so all i need to do is tell it hey i'm going to do one for social engineering two for website attack vectors two for browser exploit method two for site cloner uh say no to natting reverse connection i want to come to my ip which is 141 and then who do I want to clone that's going to be Facebook? All right, and it says, which browser exploit do you want to use? I don't know which browser the victim might have, so I'm going to go with 35, which is Autopon. What that does is it will create a version of the browser exploit for every possible browser and OS combination. So whatever you got, it's going to have a potential exploit for it. And keep in mind, there are zero days as well. So even if you've somehow made sure you patched there's only, you're only patching against the ones that the vendor knows about. So we're gonna now pick uh, two here because I want an interpreter session. If I'm able to successfully exploit the victim, I'm gonna let the port stay 443 because my interpreter is encrypted. So uh, when it comes outbound to me, I want it to look normal. In other words, if I had encrypted traffic coming out via port 80, that wouldn't look normal. But encrypted, encrypted traffic coming out of a 443 is normal. So I'm gonna leave the outbound port that they're gonna to connect to me on to set the 443, all right? So it's going in and it's, it's setting up the database. Uh, it's building and loading all the exploits in memory here. And this is where it's doing the part that I said where it's gonna configure a version of the exploits for every potential browser OS combination. And it's doing Flash exploits, QuickTime exploits, uh, JavaScript, Java exploits, you know, uh, ActiveX exploits, Microsoft browsers, uh, you know, C object handling exploits, every type of browser exploit you can imagine, it's loading a version of those so that when your machine or when the victim's browser hits it, it will look at what your browser is in the get request and send the appropriate exploits based on that. Um, so now that it's set, let's go ahead and pretend to be the victim. We're gonna just open our browser here of course, there's all kind of politics on there, and we're just going to go right to Facebook because there's nothing to help us defeat politics more than going to Facebook and getting more politics, right? Some, some good information there. <laughs> exactly. So what you find is as a result of this victim just literally trying to go to Facebook, now we could make this slicker and redirect them to the real Facebook after they take our bait, but just loading this page, that's it, we're already on the box. So as a result of that, we found it, it found a vulnerability in a browser, exploited it, gave us control of that machine. So now, if I connect to that session that was created, which is our session one right here, I, I own that machine, you know, we can take screenshots, 
see what they see on their screen. We can also, um, if we wanted to get like their credentials or something, you know, I could do Keylog Recorder. All right, and what that does is as the victim uh, would type things, right? So let's go back and play victim once more. So if the victim for, were to log into Facebook or log into somewhere else, or even, you know, log into their Chase account. And I'm not picking on Chase here. This is, this is, this is a bank agnostic. Like it's not specific to any one bank here. So if I logged into my bank account, you know, uh, by going to that, finding the login button, wherever it may be. All right, it's taking a minute to load because the browser is not happy about what we just did to it. But let's just type some other stuff. So let's pretend Camille is typing a email to Jeff. Jeff, I think Keytron hacked me and framed you for it. Can you check your logs? Camille, all right. So we send that email or whatever the case may be. Um, if we, you know, I, I didn't take the time to actually load an email client here, but I think this serves a purpose. So we s pretend like we send that email. Uh, we go back over to the play attacker again. We stop the key log recording. It says, hey, I saved all keystrokes in that machine to this text file. Well, guess what? If we go now and read that text file on our hacker machine, what we see is the keystrokes that Camille entered on that machine. You know, there's the browser chase. There's a message she typed up. I think he can frame me for it, blah, blah, blah. So whatever she types is gonna show up in this text file. And that's just scratching the surface. So this is, this is literally um, one of the classic labs that I walk students through uh, in, I think, day three, yeah, day three of the ethical hacking course. This is a lab that I walk them through, teach them how to do this, make them do it a few times so that they, they, they're sure that they got the steps down. <clears throat> and then we drive, dive into the, um, you know, the technology and uh, why it works and that type of thing. Um, so that's why you don't ever use public Wi-Fi. You always use Wi-Fi or use internet that you control. If you don't, if you go to, if you're traveling or something like that, you want to just use your phone, tether your phone to your laptop or something of that nature, because uh, using public Wi-Fi, this could very easily happen to you. And again, VPNs don't help you. VPNs only give you confidentiality. VPNs don't stop you from getting exploited if you hit a malicious site that's got like browser zero days in it. So the solution here is simple. Don't use public Wi-Fi if you have an option. And if you're, if you're an important enough employee to be using VPNs that frequently, then you should be able to get approval for uh, them to pay for broadband or something for you on your mobile device. And you can even get it inside your mobile device as well. Um, but that's kind of how you would mitigate that. There's other things uh, that would keep this from happening on your corporate network. But remember, attackers don't stop attacking you when you go to get off your corporate network. When you go to these public places, that's where you're more vulnerable. Right. Well, thank you, Keytron. And, and if I get blamed for any hacking here, I'm turning it uh, back <laughs> on you. But um, so that was just, you know, a really great way to see how, you know, it's not simple, but in, in essence, um, you know, if there's bad guys out there that want to do um, something to you, it's it's not too hard to to find. Um, so thank you for that demo. I, I know everyone is enjoying that and we're getting some good questions about that um, that we'll get to now. So moving on to questions here, um, we've got a few good ones coming through and feel free to submit more. We'll get to just about as many as we can today. Um, but to combine a few questions here, um, what kind of experience should someone have before entering the course? And can someone without any cybersecurity or hacking on hacking experience kind of understand the materials? Yeah, I think, I don't think you have to have cybersecurity experience to uh, be successful in this course because we start at a very kind of ground level position. 
but it is helpful if you've got some technical experience, right? And I don't mean you have to have written uh, programs, like you don't need to be a developer, you don't need to be a coder. Those things help, but it's definitely not necessary. So let me just give like kind of a baseline. If you can set up Wi-Fi, like if you can set up your own Wi-Fi router, you can set it up, plug it in, follow the instructions, uh, you understand what an IP address is. If I told you to ping google.com, you could do that without me having to tell you specifically click start, click run, type CMD. You could figure out how to ping google.com. Uh, if I told you to reset your Windows password, you could figure out how to reset your password. That's kind of like the baseline level. That's like the lowest level that we think is appropriate for coming into this class. But if you can do those things, you have some technical hands-on skills, um, it, you fit in nicely. You know, you would, you would have a lot to learn, but it would be a fun learning experience. Sure. So cybersecurity experience, I don't think is required. I just think that you need some hands on, you know, you've built the network, even if it's your small home network, you know what an IP address is, you know how to get this stuff connected and running. Sure. Sounds good. Hopefully that, uh, I think that answers a couple of the questions we had come through. So thank you on that. Um, question from Nick said, would you, would you say it's ever too late to get into the cybersecurity realm? Um, you know, he said he's feeling maybe a little bit late to the game. So, you know, what is a good way to just kind of to jump into cybersecurity? I mean, I, so I think obviously taking, you know, even, I would even say maybe for some people even do this before Security Plus or, or, or just do this because you jump right into the hands-on. Like a lot of the other lower level certs are more about just memorizing technique terms and things like that so that you can know what these terms mean. But if you're kind of a trial by fire person, I learn by sitting down and doing it, this is a place that you should gravitate your tel yourself towards and just jump, jump into it and start playing around because, um, I, don't, because I don't think it's ever too late. You know, the thing is, is how, how much tenacity, um, you know, you put into it and how much effort you put into learning. I think that's really the on, only determining factor as to how well you do in this industry and how fast you get there. Now, there is some, you do need to make sure you go at a decent pace because, you know, one of the things that's a little bit disappointing to me is I've seen people that I taught ethical hacking like a year ago, right? Like they knew nothing. They came in a year ago, learned ethical hacking. Now they've given themselves like titles like threat hunting, threat hunter and stuff like that. And you can see them posting things like, oh, don't take CEH. It's, uh, it's too basic. Go do, you know, uh, another higher, more technical, harder certification. But to be honest with you, that those same people a year ago, they knew nothing. So I don't, it's disappointing to see them trying to take away the opportunity or the path for other people to get their, their foundation solid, trying to push them into something that might be a little bit more advanced. And you know, the one that we get a lot is, you know, um, the offensive security, the OSCP, like, oh, do that instead. Well, I don't say don't do offensive security. I say you still need to do this first because this is more entry level. It gives you hands on. It's more of a training, whereas OSCP is more of a proof that you've proven that you can do these things. But you still need to be trained on it because otherwise what will happen is you will get 10 years along in your career. You have all these titles, all these certs, and you are supposed to know how to do all these things, but you'll have these huge gaps in your knowledge base and you won't be comfortable or confident in what you're doing. You won't be as valuable and you just won't last, you know, in the job role if you can't actually perform. Right. And I think that's a, a good answer, especially knowing, um, you know, just the amount of cybersecurity jobs unfilled. Like we need everyone that's willing, right, to, to take on these cybersecurity roles. Um, so I agree that, you know, we've, we've heard of, of people here at uh, InfoSec that, you know, totally changed their career path. Like someone was a nurse for 15 years and then they're like, I want to do cybersecurity. So, you know, if you're willing to put in that, that time to just kind of learn it and you know, you're going to have to study and that kind of thing. But um, I, I do think too, that, you know, people can change that career path at any time. Oh, absolutely. Oops. Um, want to slide forward there. Um, so another question is, does certified ethical hacking, um, does the certification kind of work or, or would your skills apply to all operating systems? Um, 
this person says they use Mac OS and Linux quite frequently in their business. Yeah, so just to kind of give you context, you know, the, the exploit that I loaded, for example, um, let me, uh, are you sharing anything right now, Camille? Um, I've got the question slide up, but you can share again. Yeah, let me just share back really quickly here to answer that question. So if you look at the exploits that set was loading here, it was loading OSX exploits. It was loading Linux exploits. It's just that the victim happened to be running Windows, right? It's loading um, exploits for every possible OS and browser combination that you can imagine. So I don't think it's less applicable to those operating systems. I just think that in the industry, there's not as much, there's not as many exports, not as much effort put into exploiting those systems as they're not as heavily deployed. For example, if you look at the average enterprise, um, you know, you will find that most enterprise desktops are still running some form of Windows. So from an attacker standpoint, I think a lot of the export development, a lot of the research have been into exporting those operating systems because they're going to get the most bang for their buck. You know, you don't want to put a year into writing an exploit for uh, some ARP, some weird Mac application that only two people in the world use. Mm -hmm. right? You want to spend that year writing an exploit that's going to be able to export literally everyone that's running Windows. So um, that's, where, that's what you see happening. Now, there is an uptick in export development for Mac. Uh, and, you know, which is really still Linux underneath them for Unix, um, but it's still not nearly as much as you see out there for Windows. Sure. Sounds good. Um, now, a few questions kind of here specifically looking like about the exam. Um, what is, is the exam a, a practical exam, kind of a multiple choice exam? Uh, what does that look like? Do you know? So it's a multiple choice exam. Uh, there is a CEH practical version of the exam as well. So you do the, the written part first. And if you choose to go to the next level, they have the CEH practical, which is hands on. So you literally log into a, a cloud environment and you have to scan these machines and attack these machines and do that type of thing. But the CEH exam version 10, as it stands, is just a multiple choice test. Okay. And really what's happening is I think employers are starting to realize that a lot of times the value in the cert is, you know, how did they get the cert? You know, if they came through an InfoSec class that was taught by an instructor that, that drove hands-on and drove actual skill building, that's a lot different than if they got the cert just by studying a bunch of brain dumps, you know? So sure. I, think the, I think the real value there is, you know, the way that we do it, yeah, this doesn't really matter if you get it from me or if it's Eli teaching or whoever. Uh, I've kind of driven the whole creation uh, of this, the, our CEH universe. And I've been very, uh, you know, strict in, you know, how we vet the instructors for it and things like that. So you're going to get the, a good experience no matter who's teaching it. And that's kind of one of the things that we drive is you got to uh, make sure they get hands on and actually do it so that when they get the cert, they earned it and they actually know how to do stuff when they come out. And employers will see that. The cert will get you to the job. The skills will keep you the job. So uh, right. we, try to arm you, we try to arm you to get the interviews, but we also want you to keep the job once you get it because you can actually do things. Right. I like that point just because, you know, anyone can, well, not anyone, but, you know, people can memorize questions for an exam or, or really study that kind of thing. But once you pass it and get a job in certified ethical hacking, and if you haven't done it, um, you know, memorizing or, or knowing these quiz answers um, isn't necessarily going to cut it when there's uh, hackers or something in, in your system. So, and, and, and we have ways, like when I interview people to join my team, um, you know, for pen testing, you know, we, we cut through that. We look at the CEHs and the OSCPs, sure. and these people. And the way that I weed them out really quickly is the first thing you do when you see me is I give you like a hands-on test. Like I don't ask you any questions. I don't ask you uh, any questions about how TCP works and all that. I just literally say, here's a box with Kali on it. Uh, here's a network. Here's another box. It's got connectivity to the internet for you to search. You got one hour to get past this firewall and get at these three machines here. Because if you can't do that, then, you know, for me, the interview is pretty much over. Um, right. Because if, if I'm hiring you to be a senior pen tester, then you need to be able to senior pen test. You know, it's, it's, I don't care about how much paper you got. I do care about that stuff because I want those things, but I also want you to actually be able to do it 
and not only say you can do it, prove it. Because if you come interview with me, I'm, you're going to sit down in a room and you're going to have to prove that you can do uh, these phases that we talked about uh, in a system, in an environment that you haven't seen before. And when I do that, usually I would say only 2% of my candidates that have put in applications, about 2% of them actually make it past that point. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's definitely important, I'm sure, for And for I try you. to teach that in the classes that I teach. I try to, to prepare them as if they're coming to interview, you know, for me next week. I want right. you to have these skills so that most job interviews that you go on after that, you should be able to impress, you know, if you can do these things. Nice. Um, and I'm sure that's important for, you know, yourself as an employer and, and others as well. So um, I think that's, that's a good answer to the, to the question is the exam uh, is just multiple choice. There is no practical portion of the exam, but you're not going to be able to do much with that certification if you can't actually do the skills in summary. Yep, exactly. Perfect. Um, question from Jason. Are there any courses or certifications that you say maybe complement um, the CEH? And, you know, if so, what would those be? Something maybe that would help someone advance their, their career with that or, or that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So complementary. And to me, that means like either on the same level or maybe a little bit higher. Um, I would say any of the web application uh, certifications that we do, like the, the web pen test, the mobile uh, pen test. Sure. Uh, those are good compliments because you dig deep into web, you dig, dig deep into mobile devices. Um, also, the forensics would be a good one because part of being a good hacker is being able to cover your tracks. And, you know, to cover your tracks well, you need to know what forensics people look for and how to make that difficult. So uh, beefing up your forensics knowledge, I think, is necessary, you know, to be a good hacker or a good pen tester. Uh, also, the incident response is a great one because uh, that's how you start to open the door to other avenues such as threat hunting and stuff like that. Sure. Um, following up with that, does the ethical hacking course cover mobile, um, Android or iOS security or, or is that something separate? We do cover it a little bit. It's not, we don't go a ton into it because we do have a mobile um, pen testing course. It's, we deal with iOS and Android exclusively uh, in that course. And it's really just taking uh, the different modes or taking the devices and figuring out how to, to exploit them primarily through the apps that are on there. I mean, with, with, and with iOS, that's basically what you got is if you can get into any one of those apps, then we look at moving horizontally and elevating from that point and kind of the same with Android. So we touch on it, but you know, if you want the end up uh, more hands on with that, then you should take the courses specifically for that. Sure. Get in depth into, into all of those areas then. Um, what tools are needed maybe for the course or for kind of performing certified ethical hacking? So to take the course, unless you don't need any, we provide you all the tools. Uh, essentially, we give you a virtual environment that you work in where you will have all the tools pre-set up and pre-installed. And I also do kind of a thing at the end of the courses that I teach where I will walk students through how to build their own practice environment in Microsoft Azure or AWS or Google Cloud uh, so that they can either continue to use ours, you know, for uh, however long they need, or they can build their own environment. <clears throat> Perfect. Um, so looking at some more of the questions here, um, someone said that they have their bachelor's degree in business and IT management. Um, they have four years of experience in IT security. So they're planning to do the CISSP, which is, you know, another popular course. Um, but do you think that the certified ethical hacker would be a lot more valuable in combination with the CISSP or, or is it, you know, what does the value change necessarily in combination, I guess, is, is part of the question. Yeah, I think <clears throat> I, that's a good question. And I do think that, you know, having the CISSP with the CEH makes the CISSP more valuable because it means that you have a deeper understanding uh, because CISSP is more management level, right? Like it's a high level view of what an exploit is, uh, you know, what malware is. CEH is, I, I've actually done an exploit, you know. So um, you can talk about it in a little more depth. You, you're a little more confident talking about uh, what these things are if you've actually put your hands on it and done it. So I definitely think the CEH increases the value, but I also think the CISSP 
having that in combination with CEH increases the value of CEH as well. Uh, because again, it means that you have a much richer understanding of the high level policy, uh, upper management view of security as well. Looks like your audio went out there, Camille. Oh, let's see, is that better? Yeah. Perfect, um, looks like we've got time for just a couple more questions here. Um, as we wrap up, let's um, talk about um, how can you prevent this from happening in your network? So let's say, you know, you are the, the certified ethical hacker and you're watching for these people. Um, you know, what are, the, what are the main things that um, someone would wanna watch for maybe? So if, if you're talking about the specific attack that I just did, is that what the question's around? Um, it didn't, didn't necessarily specify. Yeah, so, so if, if it's the specific attack that we just did, so one thing is on your internal network, you know, you should be doing things like port security. Uh, you should have something called dynamic ARP inspection via DHCP snooping, enable that the router level, because it will look for these gratuitous ARP replies and try to block them. Right, so it would prevent you from even setting up the environment to be able to do the attack. Um, but that's in your internal environment, right? So if you are on a Starbucks Wi-Fi, you don't have access to that equipment to try to set up or configure those things. And most of the, the uh, consumer grade equipment that you'd see in places like Starbucks or at hotels, they don't even have, that equipment doesn't even have the capabilities to do these security things, which is why I just say don't use it, right? Um, but in your enterprise, yeah, DHCP snooping with, with uh, dynamic ARP inspection, uh, try to move the IPv6 as soon as you can because it takes out some of the ARP attacks to where you have to do other things. It just makes it harder. Um, also, you want to consider um, making sure that in your environment, you keep your employees off of your guest Wi-Fi because I've run into this several times already uh, in pen tests just within the last year where corporations have public wi or guest Wi-Fi that's physically connected to their corporate network, you know? So sure. I've, I've had, I literally like almost had a conniption fit because I had to really like drive home the point. But like, look at, you can't, these have to be physically separated. Like right. you can't have it this way. You have your guest Wi-Fi completely open so anyone can get on it and it's physically connected to your corporate network. And usually what I get is pushback from the infrastructure guy saying, well, you know, we've got VLANs and, and all this. And I'll have to literally go in and show like a VLAN hopping demo to see why, show them why VLANs aren't enough. You know, like you, you just have to physically separate it. So uh, that's one thing is keep your guest Wi-Fi physically separate because the same way I did this in Starbucks, I could go onto your guest Wi-Fi and get all of your customers that are on your guest Wi-Fi or worse, your employees that jump on your guest Wi-Fi at lunch so they can get around your corporate filters and look at stuff they should be looking at at work. So uh, that's, a, that's one thing that you have to consider with all of that. Sure. Um, all right, as, as we wrap up here, um, I know that we talked about mobile is, is kind of separate, but you know, covered a little bit. Um, a question asking about IoT, um, so Internet of Things and smart things are on the trend now. Um, what are some of the vulnerabilities there and, and would this class um, help cover any of that? Yeah, we do get into, we have a whole section on IoT uh, devices and we talk about some of the common vulnerabilities such as the fact that a lot of these things are just literally sitting out there kind of wide open. And um, there was a, a DNS attack last year that affected a big part of the East Coast and it was primarily propagated by um, distributed denial of service via IoT devices. You know, your uh, Echoes, your, your iHomes, your Google Homes, and those types of things. Right. But uh, even like refrigerators, Nest things, mm -hmm. ring appliances for ring doorbells and stuff like that, all these things are kind of wide open from a standpoint that you can reach them. Now, what's right. happening, what's really scary is it's just now getting to the point that a lot of uh, exploit developers are trying to write exploits for these things. And what they're finding is because they were so haphazardly built and put up that a lot of the security that we have on traditional applications and things just don't exist there. So the export writing path is a little uh, less resistive. Right. 
I know there's uh, some statistic we saw recently about, you know, the number of connected devices each home now, or, you know, the, the average home has now compared to a few years ago and, and what that can mean for um, security is just a, kind of an outstanding thought of, of all the devices that are connected. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've got all, I've got a iHome, a, a Google home and a, and an echo, you know, right. and, and, and I use them all three. I don't use them per se, but I research, like I'm trying to come up with ways to exploit them, uh, finding right. vulnerabilities in them and things like that, because that's just what I do. Um, and I've got some interesting research that I'm probably going to release within the next year or so. Interesting. We'll be looking forward to uh, looking forward to see what you come up with there. Yeah. Um, we'll do one more question here, and then it looks like we'll be uh, kind of at the end of that hour mark. Could you tell us a little bit about a um, lot of questions regarding um, how the class, how long the class is, you know, how people can take that course? Yeah, so the, the, that's a good question because the CEH class, the ethical hacking class, has went through quite a few um, evolutions in the last 10 years. Right. Now, what used to happen is we didn't have online. It was all in person. So we would all be in this conference room in a hotel, and everyone would just stay at the hotel. Like, that was kind of mandatory. You had to get a room there because we would sit down there in that conference room until 10 o'clock at night sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. just based on what people required. And then we started to migrate to where we did some online students while we had some in class. So what was happening is the online students would feel a little left out if we were staying in the classroom doing these CTFs that they didn't have access to because right. there was no physical access to the environment. Um, so what happened is we eventually got it to where all of our CTFs were then hosted online. You know, so the people online and in class would do the same thing. So now we generally go up until about five o'clock uh, is part of our normal day and we break for dinner. Some people go to dinner and don't come back because again, the CTF is self-contained and it's online. So you don't have to come back to do it. Right. People are more right. and more preferring to go back to their rooms or go home or stay at home and work on that CTF at their own pace, uh, in their own time. And then when we cover convene the next morning, I kind of walk through it, but uh, I've also had some students that have wanted to hang around. So, we do that as well for the ones that want to do that. Um, but it's just getting more and more to where there's a lot fewer students that want to sit because it, it's different if you're coming, if you're flying out here and staying at a hotel, then sure, you don't mind staying in there an extra two hours. But if you're at home and you still got to go pick up your kids and like do all these things at you know, right around five o'clock, it's not as, it makes more sense to just be able to leave and come back, you know, when you feel like it. And the online delivery and the flex portal uh, that we have has done a great job of allowing us to give students that flexibility. Sure. Very good. Well, uh, as we wrap up here, just want to thank you again for joining us today and, um, you know, a really great presentation, a lot of great questions. I want to thank the audience as well for, um, you know, participating and, and joining in in those questions. Um, as mentioned, you will receive a recording of this webinar um, later on uh, as soon as we kind of wrap up here and you'll receive the recording as well as that CPE link again in your email, which will, um, you know, then verify and, and send your certificate if you request one. Um, and with that, we'll ask that you fill out a quick survey as this is over um, so that we can kind of get some information on webinars you'd like to see in the future. And um, if you want to learn more about the ethical hacking course, the link is listed there for you, as well as a phone number to uh, call and see if we can get you enrolled in a class there. So thank you again, everyone, for joining. And special thanks to Keytron for the great presentation today. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, guys.